President of the United States, accompanied by Secretary Baker. Welcome to the Treasury Department, Mr. President. This is your second visit here during your presidency, and we're absolutely delighted to have you back. But before I introduce you, if I might, I want to welcome Don Regan back to his home away from home and take just a moment to commemorate his four years of service as our 66th Secretary of the Treasury. Don uh, is my predecessor and my successor. and I'm his. <laughs> That's why I'd like to ask him to come up here so I can give him something special that I've been keeping for him now for about a year. You see, I know Don Regan to be a man who would uh, absolutely give you the shirt off his back. And just to prove it, here's one he left here in a drawer one year ago in which I've been saving, <laughs> which I've been saving for a special occasion to return to him. Seriously, though, Mr. President, I, <clears throat> I thought it would be appropriate to take this opportunity to give Don the highest award that the Treasury Department can offer, the Alexander Hamilton Award. I know I don't need to tell you that during his time at Treasury, Don distinguished himself by contributing mightily to the success of your economic policy initiatives. His excellent reputation for reassessing the impact of government in the marketplace and strengthening the financing of the federal government is well known and well-deserved. Don, of one thing I'm absolutely certain, Alexander Hamilton, an adopted New Yorker like yourself, and a promoter of energy as a characteristic of good government executives, would be delighted with your being the recipient of this award, and it's my pleasure to present it to you. I've heard of uh, people who give you the shirt off their back, but I've never heard of one who'll give you back your own shirt. <laughs> Jim, I want to thank you very much, and I do want to uh, pay my respects to all of the people of familiar faces that I see out here, people who have worked with me. But lest you think that I didn't come prepared also, I do want to uh, say that I, too, inherited a desk, and I, too, found something in the desk. <laughs> but what I found was something I think is going to do very well for Jim Baker in the near future. You've heard of the problems in energy, perhaps energy taxes, things of that nature. Here's a position paper, Jim Baker's position paper, issue number two, action on energy, from the campaign of Jim Baker for Attorney General. <laughs> Jim? <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, Mr. President, let me bring you, let me bring the focus back to why you're here today. Last night, you spoke to the nation and asked us all to look at our fiscal responsibilities in a new light. Let me assure you that the Treasury Department is ready, willing, and eager to follow the course you've charted. Last night, you officially began the second year of your second term. Tomorrow, you begin your 75th year. We're delighted that you chose to be with us today halfway between these two important events. And so now it's my honor to do something that has been my privilege many times before, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States.
Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank all of you. It's great to be here with you. I, uh, Jim, it feels like old times, except I keep thinking I should have brought something to give to somebody. <laughs> and for you, Don, it must be like coming home again. And uh, you've already, it's kind of been touched upon here that speaking of old times, you may have heard that tomorrow is my birthday. Now you know about that. I prefer to think of it as the 36th anniversary of my 39th, but a uh, few more of these and I'll be just about due for a midlife crisis. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking about a career change. Drop this political business and see if I can't do something different like radio or the movies. Uh, well, maybe I'll give politics another three years. Now, the first thing I want to do today is to thank you for all the time and effort that you've put into reforming our nation's tax code. The work has been complicated and hard and seemingly endless. Some might even say you've been overtaxed. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't get tax reform in time for this April 15th, but I'm confident that the next time Americans have to sit down and pay their taxes, they're going to see a dramatic change for the better. We'll still be needing your help in the months ahead, keeping tax reform on track. As I outlined last night in the State of the Union, we'll be looking for several specific improvements to ensure that the final bill is pro-fairness, pro-family, and pro-future. We'll want to see return of the full $2,000 personal exemption for itemizers as well as non-itemizers, at least for those individuals in the lower and the middle income brackets. Young families starting out in new homes beset with mortgage payments and all the cost of raising children urgently need the full exemption and we're going to make sure they get it. Decades of inflation seriously eroded the value of the personal exemption and thrust an increasing share of the tax burden onto the shoulders of families with children. You might say that tax policy has made raising a family uneconomical, discouraging couples from having children or if they do, forcing spouses who might otherwise wish to stay at home into the workforce simply to maintain their standard of living. We think it's about time the federal government stopped putting the squeeze on families. You know, if anyone gives you an argument on that $2,000, that's, you know, up from $600 to two, it's kind of interesting to note how the government has been dishonestly getting tax increases without doing anything openly because if we really made the personal exemption today equal in purchasing power to when it was 600, the exemption would be $2,700. We're not even catching up with inflation in what we're asking. As far as the top rate is concerned, in our minds, 35% is the right number, just exactly half of the 70% we started with five years ago. A final bill must also include basic tax incentives for American industry, and effective dates should be ironed out so that investment decisions aren't disrupted or delayed due to uncertainty. A minimum tax should make sure no corporations or individuals avoid paying their fair share. And finally, tax brackets must be fully consistent with our desire to reduce taxes for middle-income working Americans. True tax reform must give real tax relief to low-wage earners and, and the middle class. And we want to give all Americans a leg up on the ladder of success. We should all reflect on the dramatic, even revolutionary change that tax reform represents. A consensus is forming in both parties that we must lower marginal tax rates in order to increase incentives and spur economic growth. Nothing succeeds like success, of course, and no one can any longer deny the success of marginal tax rate cuts and incentives in revitalizing the American economy and giving us 37 months of growth with low inflation. One of Secretary Baker's great contributions is his emphasis on the global economy. He realizes that America's economy can't continue to race forward if our friends and allies are lagging behind. Many of the trade problems that we're experiencing today 
are caused by the imbalance between our dynamic low-tax economy and the sluggish high-tax economies of so many of our trading partners. Trade, the lifeblood of the world economy, is also hampered by wild and unpredictable fluctuations in exchange rates. We must work to promote the expansion of world trade and growth in the global economy by strengthening economic policy coordination among our industrialized trading partners. As I mentioned in the State of the Union, I have directed Treasury Secretary James Baker to determine if the nations of the world should convene to discuss the role and relationship of our currencies. Many developing countries with large debts are in particularly dire straits, and we in the industrial world must assist them in dealing with their difficulties. We have championed free markets at home and have observed their success here and in many developing countries. We must encourage other countries to pursue these market-oriented pro-growth growth policies rather than going the route of central planning, huge government projects, and denial of property rights. In particular, we must encourage them to avoid high tax rates that only choke off incentives and slow growth. The plight of many developing countries is desperate, and the call to action is urgent. So let's begin now to spread hope and opportunity across the world by encouraging lower taxes, freer and fairer trade, and a sound monetary system. I'm asking you to vigorously pursue implementation of our proposed program for sustained growth, to address problems of debt and declining growth in the developing countries. This program calls for increased lending by commercial banks and an expansion of loans by multinational banks conditioned on structural reforms, including tax reforms in the debtor countries. A healthy, expanding world economy is the best environment for a strong, secure, and growing America. So, between tax reform, initiatives on the global economy, and your traditional and essential enforcement activities, you're going to have your hands full here at Treasury. Working together, we can make 1986 the year that tax rate cuts opened wide the doors of opportunity at home, and our program for sustained growth helped bring jobs, growth, and hope to many in the developing world. And working together, we can make 1986 a banner year for growth, stability, and prosperity. And again, I just want to say I, I thank you all for the help that you've given and the part that you've played in the great economic recovery that we're having and the fact that we stand virtually alone in the world in having achieved these particular results. So thank you all and God bless you.